shocking case of the Central Park Five gripped America in 1989 as five teenagers were sent to prison for the rape of a woman in Central Park in New York, a crime they did not commit. It wasn't until 2002 that the men were eventually exonerated and we're going to be talking to one of them, Youssef Salam, who was only 15 at the time. We're going to be doing that in just a moment. First, here's Tom Barton with a reminder of the story. It was a story that gripped America, known as the Central Park Five. They were accused of the rape and assault of a jogger in New York's most famous park in 1989. Then businessman Donald Trump was so convinced of their guilt, he called for them to be sentenced to death. The teenagers were interrogated for several hours without their parents, making videotaped confessions to detectives, which subsequently led to their imprisonment, despite no DNA evidence. While in prison and serving between 5 and 15 years for something they didn't do, convicted rapist Matthias Reyes admitted to the attack. Eventually, all five men were exonerated after tests proved their innocence. On their release, the five filed a civil suit against New York City and received $41 million in the settlement. Now their story has been portrayed through an Emmy-nominated drama on Netflix, When They See Us. Well, really pleased to say Yusuf joins us now. Yusuf, I've watched a number of documentaries about the five of you. I've also watched the series When They See Us, uh, which was so compelling. I was in tears through many parts of it. Uh, were you happy with the way that the story was told? I know that you worked with uh, some of the actors so that it was as, as authentic as possible. Uh, were you happy with it? Absolutely. It was quite liberating to go through the process of being able to see ourselves portrayed in a new version, in an updated version, so that the young people of today can get it. Because one of the things that we hoped is that as young people begin to look at what their futures are going to be, they get the opportunity to say, well, if I go into the legal system, I can be a judge that can do the right thing. I can be an officer that can do the right thing, or I can be a prosecutor that can do the right thing. And I think because of the portrayal of us in the film, it gave them an opportunity to also see that there's tremendous hope inside of them to get through anything that they can go through. You say about the, the right thing being done. I mean, this year has been absolutely unbelievable in terms of what's happened, particularly over in the States, obviously with George Floyd. Um, you know, do you still have hope uh, that the right thing will eventually be done? Because actually looking back at the past few months, I mean, it's very questionable, but you seem quite positive and, 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 and you know, very well spirited. You know, one of, the, one of the really good things about this year, especially around the globe, is that it's given us the idea and the ability to look at it with the words 2020. And so 2020 represents perfect vision. And so my hope for the future is speaking in the streets. The heartbeat that built America, the ancestors' wildest dreams have spoken out. And one of the best things that they've said is that it's not about abolition. It's not about reform, rather. It's about abolition. We used to think that the system in America was alive and well. We found out that the system is alive and sick. And so my hope is that the aspirations, the dreams, the specialness that we all come to this world to give is watered by all of the things that we have done and are doing in order to make sure that those incremental gains are made and that the future is completely different and inclusive of the kaleidoscope of the human family. And how do you feel about President Donald Trump? Uh, you're an American citizen. Uh, at the time, uh, in 1989, he took out a damning advert uh, asking for the death penalty for all five of you, even though all of you were innocent. Uh, how do you feel about him running your country today? And are you still waiting for an apology? Not waiting for an apology, uh, just trying to live my life. And I think the American speak people have spoken. We do not see him as a good president, and we are looking to the future for someone better. It is extraordinary how you manage to hold back bitterness. And uh, I'm sure you've felt some righteous anger, but, you know, when you hear that so starkly, as Alex said, Donald Trump called for the death penalty, you know, you were all sentenced and served time for a crime you didn't commit, but he wanted to go further and he's now president. Most people at that point would be so angry and furious at the way 
the state of the nation, at the very least, apart from the personal. How do you manage that bitterness? Well, I've had a lot of time to think about it. And I remember listening to the words of Dr. Maya Angelou, and what she said was, you should be angry, but you must not be bitter. She said, bitterness is like a cancer. It eats upon the host. It doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure. And then she teaches us how to become alchemists. She says, use that anger, use that anger and dance it, march it, vote it. She says, do everything about it. And then she said, talk it, never stop talking it. And I found that telling my story over and over again not only helps me to stand up straighter, but it gives other people inspiration and the ability to stand up for themselves that if I could get through what I went through, being labeled the scum of the earth, we can get through anything. You said you've written a, a... Sorry, Alex, you've written a, 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 a beautiful book. Uh, it's called Punching the Air, which I couldn't put down. Um, it's written in verse, wonderful verse, and it's very accessible. I'd urge anybody to read it, because I think it says a lot about your battle, it's not about you, it's not an autobiographical, but there's obviously lots of reflections from your experience. It tells about what it's like to be in prison, what it's like to fight the system, injustice generally, actually. And just a couple of things I'd like to read. One, it is called New ID. On the day of my conviction, I memorise my inmate number, my crime, my time. On the day of my conviction, I forget my school ID number, my top three colleges, my class schedule. And it really brings home that you were 15 with dreams and hopes and priorities of things you had to remember in your life, none of which suddenly mattered anymore because you were headed by that inmate number, that crime and your sentence on a totally different course. And you then go on to talk about how being put in chains for you felt like a weird connection, a DNA connection with the past history of black Americans with slavery. And I can imagine that must have resonated so strongly and does for so many people in America. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that becomes quite apparent as you grow up and you are one of the marginalized people that have been pushed into the oppressed side of life, you realize that this oppression that you're experiencing has been what America has imagined for you. And so rather than you being a person who's chosen things, you're actually given a path in life. And that path is a very destructive path that instead of you wanting to be able to achieve the American dream, what you're offered is only the American nightmare. And instead of you being able to aspire to the highest heights of life, they want you to aspire to only being able to go to the modern day cotton fields which is the prison industrial complex in America. And it's a quite sad reality because we need to tell our young people who are the caretakers of tomorrow that they matter. The book Punching the Air that E.B. and I wrote is the water for the seeds of greatness inside of every single one of them to let them know that they can never give up hope because if you give up hope, you become your worst enemy. You begin to have the self-defeatist mentality and you need to keep pushing and keep rising in spite of what they want you to be. Yusuf, you are incredibly inspiring. I could listen to you talk all morning. Uh, how are the other four? Everyone is doing well. One foot in front of the other, living life the best they can. Uh, many of us, we live in the Atlanta, Georgia area, so we get together almost all the time. And, uh, you know, it's just a joy to see everyone using their platform to elevate the voices of people who have been marginalized and people whose voices have been turned down. Well, Yusuf, thank you so much for joining mm. us this morning. Uh, good luck with the book and keep talking, keep inspiring and doing what you do and good luck in the future. My pleasure and thank you as well.